Okay. So good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Bridget Burton, and I'm the assistant junior manager here at the Maple House Barnes Amphitheater. Welcome to Thursday, 30, Thursday, 30. Um, this is our third install. Are just having you know quick conversations with different people in arts and culture and humanities, and we range from a lot of different things. We kicked off uh, the Thursday 30 with the Cobb County Parks Director Jimmy Giese, who talked about the history of the Mabel House Complex and where we kind of are in his vision for Mabel House in the future. And then last week, we talked to concert promoter Jeremy Hill, who um, rents the Mabel House Barnes Amphitheater and just kind of his experience and background as a concert promoter and the things that he was going to do at Mabel House. So today, we're getting away from, you know, the, the Mabel House kind of story and just kind of going out into the, the general um, Atlanta theater community or the Atlanta arts community. And so we brought Calendra Smith on board with us. She is a theater critic and arts journalist um, in the city of Atlanta. Um, so I'm pretty excited. And it's also pretty cool because Calendra is one of my good friends and we went to college together at the University of Georgia. Um, and I'm really kind of honored to be able to have this opportunity to interview her. So um, I did see some questions beforehand, but did just want to, if you want to kick it off and just tell a little bit about yourself, your ele elevator pitch or your bio, <laughs> and then, then we can go into the questions that we kind of sent off. Well, good morning and thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be speaking with uh, you today and having an opportunity to talk about arts criticism. Um, anybody who knows me knows that you don't have to talk to me for longer than about five minutes before I start talking about the urgent need for arts journalism and arts criticism to anybody who's willing or unwilling to listen. Uh, so <laughs> I'm very excited um, to have this conversation this morning. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, I have been working as an arts critic and journalist in Atlanta for the past six years. Um, I started writing arts journalism and arts criticism. Actually, funny enough, Bridget mentioned that we went to school together at the University of Georgia. And our senior year, the summer before our senior year, we went to a study abroad trip to London. And in that, um, during our time studying in London, we took a performance critique class. And that is what first kind of sparked my interest in doing arts criticism. And so from there, I went to Syracuse University and studied arts journalism and started freelancing for various um, newspapers in upstate New York. And then when I moved back to Atlanta, I continued to freelance writing for places such as Arts ATL and the Atlanta Journal Constitution and Atlanta Magazine, and have just been building um, from there in terms of um, the various outlets I write for, including the New York Times and Food and Wine and the Oxford American and other regional and national publications. Um, so that has kind of been my winding path um, to arts criticism. And I'm an Atlanta native. Um, I consider all of Metro Atlanta to be my home. Uh, I was born at Northside Hospital, like everybody else. Um, so I'm really- I'm a um, baby. No, I'm, I'm <laughs> uh, So yeah, I'm excited to uh, dig into the conversation. Yeah, um, you kind of touched a little bit, you know, about it when we studied abroad in London. Um, but, you know, the first question is, what got you interested in theater criticism? Um, you know, were there any specific articles or something from that class that kind of just sparked it, you know, for you? Um, so for me, I always really loved writing. Um, writing for me came before theater. I started writing um, like little short stories and things like that just for myself um, when I was like six and seven years old. Um, you know, if you ask my mother, I started reading and writing when I was three and four. Um, so writing for me was the love that came first. And then when I got a bit older, um, I got into theater because theater is where teachers tend to put the kids who talk too much in class. And so <laughs> um, I was always selected for the school programs and to do things like that. So that is, you know, kind of as a child, how my interest in both of those things uh, started to bloom. And then when I went to college, you know, a lot of the time when young people are in school that people try to force them to kind of choose a path, like which one are you going to do? And I didn't want to choose. And so I literally went and did a Google search one day for like arts journalism programs. Um, and there were four 
in the country at the time. Um, and I applied to all of them and that kind of just set off that path. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we, for those, of course, I'm, I'm, I know a lot of things about Calandra, so I'm like, uh, asking these questions, but I'm also guiding her to different things that I know about her. Um, before I get into the next question, just know that if anyone, uh, our attendees, if you have questions, you can definitely put those in the chat in the question and answer segment. So when I finish my questions, you can ask and you know, ask questions to us and we'll be building those questions in the chat box. Um, so the next question is, you know, you've been an actress. Um, uh, you've been an actress and then you've also directed as well. So what has been your theater experience? Sure. So um, I came to theater like um, a lot of folks when it came to acting. I started, um, you know, really getting, I guess, serious about it in high school. I remember my first role, Southwood at High School in Snellville, Georgia. I was at uh, the Queen of Hearts in Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> and then I went on to do uh, King Lear and I, I directed a production of A Raisin in the Sun in high school and then, you know, continued to do stuff in college. I, my first play in college, I remember, was a play called Real Women Have Curbs, which some people may have seen the movie, which stars America Ferreira. Um, so I, I did all of that, um, acting, directing, and exploring in that way. And now I'm actually kind of entering a new phase of, of my theater um, career, I guess you would say, which in addition to criticism, I've now find myself kind of becoming an accidental playwright, which is uh, both fun and, and terrifying. Um, so it's 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 all of it for me you know i love to tell stories i often say that at heart i am a storyteller um and so that is what drives me is i'm looking to tell stories that connect people to cultural experiences and to each other i love that awesome i had to change up my location while i was buffering a little um but yeah so um there we go there we go and you know what important obviously things that theater. you think a theater critic should consider um what were you saying oh can you hear me out yes i can hear you okay i was just saying what are important things that you think a theater critic should consider in writing a review so um if you want to touch a little bit but you know because we've talked about arts journalism as a whole We've talked about your experience, but, you know, what does a theater critic do, you know, for those who may just kind of be novice in that particular sure. segment of theater? And then you want to if you want to transition to what important things you think a theater critic should consider. So I'll tell you, you could talk to 20 theater critics and they would probably all give you different answers as to what does a theater critic do, right? <laughs> or what is the role of the theater critic? Um, and I think that everybody has to define it for themselves. A lot of people, when they think of uh, arts critics of any time, kind, or they think of people who have a pen and you know notepad in their hand, who are going and they're sitting in the aisle seat and they're taking notes about a play. And then those notes become an article that determines whether that play sees the light of day for a long time or a short time, right? That's how most people think of criticism. Um, but for me, I also think it's important to note that a lot of what we know about arts history, whether we're talking about theater, visual art, film, television, what have you, is based on criticism. So for me, the theater critic is at first a historical documentarian because theater is an inherently ephemeral art form, right? I mean, a play goes up and then after it's over, the marketing materials are tossed, the play, the set is tossed, the props are gone away, those costumes were made for, you know, somebody to their measurements and only their measurements. They're not necessarily going to fit anybody else. So, you know, it, it's gone. But the criticism is what's left. And to me, the criticism puts the play not only in historical context, but also allows people in the future to know, okay, this is what was concerning artists and citizens of this moment. 
and also allows for people who may never see the play to have an idea of what it was. You know, one of the things I talk about a lot when I write about Broadway specifically is that, you know, when people in Atlanta or in other parts of the South where I write, read my stuff about Broadway, they may never go to New York, but they can get a good idea of what, you know, say, like I wrote about the Tina Turner musical last fall, you know, they'll know what the Tina musical was about, even if they never have a chance to see it. And I think that's really important because it opens your mind to new worlds and broadens your perspective. Yeah, I think that's really good to consider. I mean, you know, for for us taking a class, you know, I only took that one class in terms of theater analysis, but we had to think about things like what does the stage look like? What is what are the costume things? What are the lighting? You know, how is it making you feel? Um, because it was that kind of like documentation um, to to kind of consider, you know, and thinking about, you know, these different things of a, of a stage experience. So, um, you know, a person has to kind of be knowledgeable about all those different things. And so mm -hmm. our program at the University of Georgia, you know, we took a, a technical theater course to know about at least the basics of lighting and stuff, but you have to be able to write that. And I think that's what takes it to another level. Mm -hmm. um, sure. And which kind of segues into our next question, like what resources um, are available for those interested in criticism or arts journalism you know we talked about you know technical theater courses uh you know different classes but for you if you were to give advice to those coming up and interested what would you offer as resources sure so i'm gonna say the thing that most folks don't like to hear which is that uh the only way to i think really get good at something is to like become a voracious reader about it and of it um, so read the places that are doing it best or that are regarded as doing it best. Read, um, you know, on a local level, Arts ATL and Burnaway are two um, awesome arts criticism outlets. But then if you're looking on a national um, scale, I mean, you've got to look at what those critics who write for places like the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Chicago Tribune, the San Francisco Chronicle, Houston Chronicle, some of those premier um, papers and magazines such as uh, the New Republic, the Atlantic, the New Yorker um, are writing, you know, look at what the best are doing. Um, and that will start to give you a feel for um, what, you know, the field looks like right now and also what your unique voice could be in it. Um, I would also say just in terms of um, text um, that I really like to refer people to, there's this book, do not ask me to remember who wrote it, um, but it is called Teach Yourself Postmodernism. And for me, it is probably one of the most helpful books I've ever um, read in terms of thinking about how to think about uh, theater um, and about what we're seeing in the art world in general. Um, and it really breaks down different concepts that can seem very highbrow and makes them really simple. Um, and then the other thing I encourage people to do is, you know, there's no replacement for just doing it. So, I mean, if you have um, the ability to start a blog, which there are so many free um, websites and things like that to be able to do it, and you start going to plays and just writing down you know, what it is that stands out to you, what it is you notice, um, what it is that um, hits you and doesn't hit you and, and start to really excavate why, um, that's a great way to start um, doing that. And then of course, once you get further into it, there are opportunities to be able to um, get mentorship and further training such as um, the American Theater Critics Association offers opportunities like that. Um, there's a place in Connecticut called the Eugene O'Neill Theater Center that does the National Critics Institute. Um, for college students, I highly recommend uh, getting connected with the Kennedy Center American College Theater Festival. They have a criticism program there where it's all expenses paid um, for people who are interested in um, getting into theater criticism. And I actually will be a guest critic for the Kennedy Center American uh, College Theater Festival in January of next year um, for one of the regions involved. So that's a, also an awesome opportunity in this year. And I have to say this, a good friend of mine out of New York um, has started what they're calling the BIPOC Critics Lab. 
uh, as a part of that. So that is specifically a criticism opportunity available for um, those who are identified as people of color. See, I didn't know about a lot of that stuff. I know, you know, about the American Theater Critics Association through you, but some of those other resources I did not know about. So that is very helpful to know. Um, of course, um, for those, you know, Calandra and I are both in the theater, you know, world. Um, and so over time, you will hear about different things that have happened. So, um, you know, in Chicago, there are some very known theater critics who, you know, did get some backlash for some of the reviews that they did. Um, and so that was just an interesting just conversation piece for those in the industry as practitioners in the field. Um, so for you, I thought it was just good to add at comments about your reviews and how have you handled them? <laughs> um, that's, that's actually the most common question I get is when you write a review and somebody doesn't like it, how do you handle it? <laughs> um, the answer is yes. People have not liked uh, some of the reviews I've written, both positive and negative. Uh, people always think you only get a response to a negative review. That is not true. Um, sometimes if you like things that the audience doesn't like, you get feedback on that as well. Um, so um, I, I have gotten that feedback. And you know, you take it on a case by case basis because it depends on what people want. And to be just really transparent with you, I have found that a lot of the time people like to rant into a vacuum. And then when you actually respond to them and try to open up and have a conversation about it, they completely don't think that anybody's going to respond or have a conversation with them. So they immediately retreat. <laughs> Um, and so it, that that happens, I would say, probably 90 percent of the time. Um, and, and it's interesting because I think social media has kind of allowed people to get used to that sort of a dynamic where like you rant into a, a vacuum as if your words impact no one. Um, and I always I, I make it a point to try to answer um, every email in that regard, because I want people to know there's a person you're talking to on the other end of this. We hear a lot of the time about the media, this, the media, that it's like, well, the media are just a bunch of people who are your neighbors, whose kids go to kids with uh, school with your kids who shop at the same grocery stores as you do. <laughs> so, um, you know, I make a point of responding and it's not, you know, a, a disrespectful or mean response. I'm always open to have conversations. Um, I've been confronted it by playwrights who did not like my reviews of their plays and I'm willing to have a conversation with them about that but I can honestly tell you that in um, I've been doing this in Atlanta six years almost 10 years total I've never uh, rewritten a review and it never changed my mind I look back at stuff that I wrote when I was 22 23 years old and I can say now like okay I would have written that differently or worded that differently but the overall opinion is still the same <laughs> and, <laughs> that's hilarious I mean well you know I think it's 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 fun because I think what you also do you know just observing you is you know and I, I can't speak to anybody else because you're probably one of the few theater critics that I do know but I do think you try to research you know because you have the journalism background you know you've been a journalist in your undergraduate and your master's, you know, experiences. So you know about the research component. So you research the plays, you research uh, the the playwrights, you know a little bit about the, the context of the play in which they're coming from, you know. So if we're thinking about a play like Rome, for example, you know, it's coming from a context of, you know, imagining what's after a raisin in the sun, in a sense, you know. Uh, if you're thinking about, you know, Mamma Mia, you know, or something like that. Like, you know, th there's context to this the city in which, I mean, you know, to to the location, the locale of, yeah. you know, those things. So, um, there's research that goes into it. So, any commentary that you have about it is like how honest are you know that playwright or those actors being to the context of it, and then also to what's happening, you know, around based on the playwright's history. You know, we're talking about Terrell McCraney, and he has you know, Moonlight that came out, but then also he had the brother-sister plays before then. And so there was a specific context to the characters in which he, you know, had Oya being, you know, with the first one, you know, Oya being a, a reference to the Orishas. And so what are the Orishas? You know, so 
<laughs> you know, yeah. there's context to this. You can't necessarily write a review about the brother sister plays without having context to what he's writing about uh, as a whole in totality. You know, Death of a Salesman being, you know, when we studied it and that was one of the first plays being like a realistic play and we're talking about it, but it was also talking about the American dream as a whole and a, a reflection on society. So when you're talking about this man who's going through and experiencing, you know, a decline in health, but also how he achieved his dream with his family, you know, the death of a salesman was really like a, a commentary on this. You can't write a review about the death of a salesman and just talk about the actor acting. You also have to know about the context of what was happening in America, what it, what that play is reflecting on in terms of America and how people went through the middle class um, and had their job. So, you know, there's also, you know, those components in there. So I think it's interesting. Like you said, some people may just write and have these viewpoints about it, but there are critics who are actually doing that research and developing all those things. So we yeah. have about 20, 10 minutes left. We kind of talked a little bit. Marie, were there any questions in our question and answer segment? Um, yeah, feel free if you are um, got any questions. Um, there is a little chat box um, in the corner that you can type in your questions and I will um, be happy to ask them. One of the questions I had, um, Calandra, was what's your favorite show by far that you have seen um, as far as your theater experience? Like what show have you watched that you've just been completely blown away by? You know, that's another common question, and I really don't have an answer. I know that people hate that, but like, it really, I love theater. I love so many different types of theater. It is so hard for me to even begin to say, um, you know, oh, this is, this is the one, you know, that, that tops them all. Um, it, it's just hard for me to even narrow it down in that way. I, I will say, I usually turn that question around as I say, I'll tell you what my first Broadway show I saw was. <laughs> so the first show I ever saw on Broadway was the original uh, cast of the Color Purple musical, uh, which for people who are from Georgia know that the Color Purple has a long history here because Alice Walker is from Edenton, Georgia. Um, and a lot of the setting that she imagines in that book, which has been adapted into the musical, is set in, in Georgia's landscape. Um, and so that was very, very special for me. I was, I think, 16 or 17 years old at the time that that uh, musical premiered on Broadway um, at the Broadhurst Theater. I'll never forget it. Um, my mother surprised me. I wore purple. Um, and so um, that musical, I remember seeing and being so blown away with the detail. I mean, they created these projections of like blowing grass. I mean, it's, it's like anybody who's seen the Lion King musical, you know, you see like just the the incredible details in the puppetry. So I, I think that um, from, I always just turn it and say that, but as far as a favorite, I just couldn't choose. I will, I can say, I tend to prefer plays over musicals and that um, there's a genre of plays called comedy of manners, which is like, kind of farce meets satire. Um, and that's probably one of my favorite genres, but I can't choose a favorite, sorry. <laughs> I mean, I, I can totally understand that. Um, so I, I have somebody who did say, um, they're very glad that you're here. They've been, um, you know, admiring you for years. And so they're very happy to see you um, on our Thursday 30. So just, Thank you for coming out with us as well. Um, another question I had too, though, is I did notice, um, you know, you've been published with like the New York Times. Like, how does it feel to, um, I guess, get that phone call and to receive that, um, I guess, offer to get the publication? Yeah, that's, um, that's it's so funny that you asked that because um, I remember at the time that I first was uh, got connected with the New York Times, I had actually applied for a job there. And um, the culture editor, editor at the time and the theater editor um, called me and basically it was, I always say it was the kindest rejection uh, phone call I ever got in my life <laughs> where they basically said, you know, we are not hiring you for the position for which you applied. However, we think you're an awesome writer and we'd love for you to be able to contribute some articles to us. Um, and so I have to say that at the time that was what, maybe three, four years ago, 
um, for a young writer is very validating in many ways um, because with all of the changes that have happened in the media industry um, and in the theater industry, it can sometimes, especially now, I mean, artists are in complete, you know, the upside down is, <laughs> you know, uh, during during COVID-19, which is why it's so awesome what Mabel House is doing to keep people um, continually connected to the arts uh, during this time, because we need the arts. Um, the arts help people heal um, and they also, you know, spread empathy. So um, I have to say that, you know, getting that call from the Times um, was extremely validating for me as a young writer. And I'm happy that I've been able to continue to have that relationship and that um, I've been able to elevate Southern art to new places because everywhere I'm right, I'm writing about the South. And that's important to me. Um, I had another one, I guess, if you don't have a favorite theater or a play, uh, well, experience, would you care to talk about maybe some of your favorite playwrights um, in that instance? You know, I have been lucky in that I've been able to interview a couple of my favorite playwrights, um, which a lot of people um, aren't able to say that. I would say that uh, one of my favorites is Tony Kushner. Many people may be familiar with his play Angels in America, which was adapted into a film for HBO several years ago. Um, I had an opportunity to interview him a few years ago about his musical Caroline for Change. And it was so funny. Talk about being young and, and not knowing when somebody's giving you scoop. Uh, so at the time I interviewed him, one of the things I always ask when I do interviews is, um, you know, is there anything else you'd like for me to know? And he says to me, oh, I'm working on this, you know, movie uh, about, you know, the Civil War um, <laughs> with Steven Spielberg. And I'm like, oh, okay, cool. You know, it'd be fun to see when it comes out. Little did I know he was talking about the Oscar winning film Lincoln. Uh, <laughs> so uh, that, was, that was definitely one of those early lessons as a young journalist of like, always ask the follow up question, silly. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, so that was really fun. Um, so Tony Kushner is one. Um, other playwrights I really love, contemporary playwrights especially, would be um, Terrell Alvin McCraney, you mentioned, uh, Mike Liu, uh, Madhuri Shekhar. Um, I really like Pro Clegg. I mean, I think it's, you know, she's hometown uh, hero, and so it's hard to not love Pro Clegg. Um, I, I really enjoy... Um, Let's see. There's so many. David Lindsay Abair is another one who I've had the opportunity to interview and also really enjoy his work. For those who uh, may not know who he is, he wrote Shrek the Musical, <laughs> which I have to say is quite delightful. <laughs> um, and uh, he also um, wrote uh, the Great and Wonderful Oz movie from a year, few years ago. Um, I also like uh, Jere Brian Holder, who um, is a writer on um, New Amsterdam, which is a show on NBC now. Uh, Becca Brunsetter, who's a writer on This Is Us, um, who started with the play The Cake, who some folks in Atlanta may have seen when it was at Horizon a year or so ago. Um, so I like a lot of contemporary um, playwrights, a lot. And then if we're talking about the classics, you've got to love your Neil Simon, your Lorraine Hansberry, your, uh, your August Wilson, your George Wolfe, um, all of those, Sandra C, uh, not Sandra Cisneros, goodness gracious, Josefina Lopez, um, you gotta love those folks. So. <laughs> I love it. Um, so we're basically at time. We, you know, got two minutes left, um, but I think we're done with questions. I didn't see any more in the chat. Um, so next week, of course, we're doing this every Thursday at 11 o'clock. Um, we do have a teaching artist and puppeteer that's coming up next Thursday, which we're really excited about. Um, so definitely join us again next Thursday. The link to this will be available on our social media networks to share. Um, so that people who didn't get a chance to see us and, and join us today, um, definitely, you know, you can continue to follow Calundra on social media. Um, to just know about more upcoming things that she has going on. And of course, follow us at Mabel House, um, the Mabel House Art Center and the Mabel House Amphitheater for more content like this. So thank you so much, Kalendra, for joining us. And we really do appreciate you taking your time to join us and talk about your experience.
Yeah, I'll shamelessly plug my social media. So um, <laughs> um, if you're on Instagram, I'm at another piece of K. So I spell piece of K like a piece of cake, but so P-I-E-C-E-O-F-K-A-Y. Uh, so I'm at another piece of K on Instagram and on Twitter, I'm at piece of K. So E-I-E-C-E-O-F-K-A-Y. Um, and you can, or you can just type in my name, Calundra. I'm the only one out there. Um, <laughs> so um, I appreciate you all um, having me on and I look forward to uh, seeing what more um, is, is coming from this series. I've enjoyed um, seeing what you all are doing and I'm so happy that you had me on today. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. We really do appreciate it. All right, take care. Take care, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.